All right, well, um, Tony, thank you so much for being here. It's really good to talk to you as always. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you about something you said to me um, the last time we spoke. Um, you know, you've spent more time anticipating what is happening right now than most anyone. And when we last we spoke, you said, um, it's like a chain, one weak link and the whole thing falls apart and you need no weak links about preparedness. It feels like we've had a lot of weak links and I wondered um, how you're thinking about how America has done against the pandemic so far. Well, Ed, I mean, obviously, if you look at what is going on now and the situation that we find ourselves in, it really has been very challenging. We would like to be at a point now where, I mean, an outbreaks occur, they've occurred throughout the world, they've peaked in various places. We've had a very difficult time, particularly a couple of months ago, when the northeastern part of the country, particularly the New York metropolitan area, which actually was dominant in what was going on in our country. There was one time you might recall, Ed, where about 50% of the new infections were occurring out of that area, but they successfully came down and went down to baseline. The difficulty is that if you look at the country as a whole and look at the cases where we went up, hit a peak, started to come down, but our baseline became 20,000 cases a day. We never got down to what some of the Asian countries and what some of the European countries have been able to do. Because when you get down to a baseline that's minimal, where the number of new cases are measured in dozens and not hundreds and thousands, then when you do get blips, you can contain them as opposed to needing to always go to mitigation. So the unfortunate situation, Ed, with us is that when we came down, we came down to 20,000, 20,000, 20,000. And then understandably, which was the correct thing to do, we were trying to so-called open America again. And again, you remember the guidelines came out that we know we're in a difficult situation, but we wanna open the country again for all of the compelling reasons, the economic reasons, the reasons of stress, employment, et cetera. So as we tried to do that, open America again, we put a series of guidelines. We had the entry, the gateway, phase one, phase two, things that people are very familiar with now. The problem is, since we started off our baseline so high, as we tried to open up, you saw that there was a, a wide variation in how that was done. And pictures and photos and films of people at bars with no uh, mass congregating in crowds, the inevitable happened. You know, you talk about different links and what we saw was it went from 20,000 cases a day to 30, 40, 50, and now we're hanging around 60,000. That's untenable. We've got to turn that around, Ed. And that's really the issue we've got to address right now because if you look at other countries, not all of them, but many of them, have gotten to baseline and now us are in a measured fashion trying to open. So we've got two things to do simultaneously. We've got to get that baseline down and we've got to in a measured way, try to do something that we have to do. And that is to try and carefully and prudently reopen. And how do we do that, Tony? Because it feels like um, that call to carefully and prudently reopen was, was what people have been saying um, early on in the in the late spring and the it, you know some would argue that the premature reopenings the rush to reopenings um have led to what you described as this inevitable situation so so given that we are now in this place where cases are surging what do we do how do we how do we get things back to a better place well ed what, what i believe we need to do and, and it's very complicated i mean i i think you can't give a unidimensional explanation for it for so many different reasons. There are so many factors getting into it, but I believe we need to almost push the reset button. And by the pushing a reset button, I don't mean everybody locking down again. I mean, obviously that's the more draconian. And I do not mean that. I wanna make sure because whenever I allude to it as something that should be considered, everyone thinks that I said that. No, what we need to do is say, we're not going in the right direction now. So we got to call a timeout, do a pause and say, what do we need to do? 
we need to take a look and maybe we need to walk back a bit and say, if you are going to open, we've got to get everybody on the same team. Because if you look at states, I'm not going to name any states. That's not helpful. But some states did, in fact, prematurely jump over some of those, those um, what we call checkpoints and maybe went from one to the other. Other situations where they officially did it correctly, they gave the guidelines to the community, but the community didn't respond. I mean, they almost made it an all or none. I remember months ago when we first came out with the guidelines to reopen, I said at the White House press room, I said, the one thing we want to avoid is an all or none phenomenon. We don't want to go from lockdown to devil may care. And if you look at what went on in some places, even when the governors and the mayors were telling the citizens to do it in an orderly way, the way some states and cities did, and there were good examples of that, including the New York metropolitan area, which did it in, in a stepwise fashion. What we saw were people who maybe understandably uh, and innocently felt, well, you know, I'm young and the chances are that if I get infected, there's not gonna be any major impact. I likely will not get any symptoms because 20 to 40% of the people who get infected don't have any symptoms. So it's almost natural for a young person to mistakenly think that. But what they're missing, and that's when I say we need to reset, we've got to get that mindset that when you get infected, let's say you're a young person, and we know what I'm saying is true, Ed, because the age range of the people who are getting infected today mm -hmm. is about a decade and a half younger than the age range of the people who were getting infected back a few months ago. So we've got to get the mindset for those people to understand that if I am a young person and I get infected, even if I get no symptoms at all, if I'm one of the 30, 40% who get no symptoms, that inadvertently, and I'll even use the word maybe innocently, I am part of the problem because I'm propagating the outbreak. You can't think that if you get infected, and that's why when I hear about these COVID parties, it just you know makes my head spin because when you get infected, what you're doing is you're not in a vacuum. You are part of the propagation of the outbreak. And the chances are, we know statistically, that you're going to infect someone else who then is going to infect someone else who then all of a sudden you're going to infect somebody who gets sick and goes to the hospital. Test is asked. The reports out of this morning that the hospital rates are going up and even the death rates are going up. So you can't think that you're operating in a vacuum. You've got to accept the societal responsibility sure. that if we want to stop this, everybody's got to contribute. You can't say, I don't care. So Tony, I, I completely agree with that. And while I, while I um, get your point to that, we all have a personal responsibility to play. Um, uh, to, um, I, I also feel like the, surely the federal government needs to take more of a hand in this. Um, it has been criticized for um, failing to uh, coordinate the efforts across the country. And just yesterday, we've heard that the Trump administration is removing the CDC from control over coronavirus data. Why? You know, if you have what is arguably the world's greatest public health agency at your disposal, why sideline them? You know, I don't know, Ed. I, I, I have not been involved in that. Uh, I, I'd like to give you a reasonable explanation, but I've just been removed from that aspect of the outbreak, you know, focusing as I do on developing vaccines and drugs and things. I've not gotten into that. But so, you know, you, you um, when we last spoke, you mentioned that you had advised every president um, since Reagan, and you have clearly been called on to serve your country now, again, advising Donald Trump. And the last time we spoke, you said any kind of recommendation that I've made thus far the substance of it, he has listened to everything. It seems like that's no longer the case. Is it the case? Can you update us on your relationship with the, with the president? Well, Ed, Ed the, 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 the scene has changed a, a bit because back then when we were having daily press conferences, in fact, there was a period of intensity, you recall, 
when we were meeting with the task force seven days a week and we were having a frequent press briefing. So I had the opportunity to, in a personal one on one, to mm -hmm. talk to the president. That's changed a bit now. I haven't done that in a while. But what has not changed, and I think, you know, in credit to the vice president, who has been very heavily involved in this, and we, we don't have as many task force meetings, it's not every day, but we do have it, you know, two or three times a week, and the physicians and public health people meet even more frequently. So I could say a day does not go by that I am not in contact with Debbie Berg, so with uh, uh, Bob Redfield or Steve Hahn and others. So we do that and we go down and, and, and my, my input to the president is now a bit indirect. It goes through the vice president, but clearly the vice president literally every day is listening to what we have to say. There's no doubt about that. Okay, and Tony, I do have to ask you about this because um, you have been the subject of um, several, I would class, classify them as attacks um, from other folks in the White House. Um, you know, Trump himself has said on an interview, he's a nice man, but he's made a lot of mistakes. Advisors have said he's been a detriment to getting the economy reopened. That's Stephen Moore. He has been wrong about everything I've ever interacted with him on. That's Peter Navarro. Um, officials have distributed what essentially is oppo research. Um, and you are the government's top health advisor. And the government you're trying to advise is actively trying to discredit you. How do you work like that? Well, that is a bit bizarre, and I have to tell you, <laughs> I think if I sit here and just shrug my shoulders and say, well, you know, it's, it's life in the fast lane. <laughs> you know, it, it is a bit bizarre. I don't really fully understand it. You know, I think that what happened with that list that came out, I think if you sit down and talk to the people who were involved in that, uh, they are really, I, I think, taken aback by what a big mistake that was. And I think uh, if you talk to reasonable people in the White House, they realize that was a major mistake on their part because it doesn't do anything but reflect poorly on them. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that that was their intention. I don't know. I cannot figure out in my wildest dreams why they would want to do that. But I mean, I think they realize now that that was not a prudent thing to do because it's only reflecting negatively on them. I can't explain Peter Navarro. He's in a world by himself, so I don't even want to go there. All right. Um, you know, Tony, you, um, everyone I know who knows you has specifically talked about the fact that you are indefatigably honest. Um, that is your reputation, someone who always tells the truth. So, you know, I, I would love for you to tell us the truth about the federal response to the pandemic. Like, do you think that the government is doing enough? Like, is the public, um, you know, are we getting the honest truth from mm -hmm. folks in charge? Yeah, yeah. well, Ed, I'll, I'll answer your question, you know, but one of the things that's part of the problem is the dynamics of the divisiveness that is going on now, that it becomes difficult to engage in a dialogue of honest evaluation of what's gone right and what's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Because once you do that, and this has happened countless times to me in the last couple of months where right. you try and explain something and in the explanation, not the person you're talking to like you, but someone will hear a clip, pull out five words, and then that becomes the story. And when you're trying to essentially uh, in uh, sort of uh, direct all of your efforts and your energies to solving the problem, you immediately get distracted off in a divisive, you know, um, conflict of words. Did you say this? And did you mean that? And to me, that's the most disturbing part about mm -hmm. it, because it distracts from what I would hope would be the common effort of getting this thing under control rather than this back and forth distraction, which just doesn't make any sense. Now, to answer your question, because I'm not running away from it, because you did say, and it's true, I'm an honest person, I've always been that way, and I won't change no matter what, is that when you look at the numbers, obviously, Ed, we've got to do better. What is going on now? And you look at our country, we've got to do better. So rather than figuring out you know, who was wrong, who did anything wrong. That's what I want, meant when I said a couple of minutes ago, we've got to almost reset this and say, okay, 
let's stop this nonsense and figure out how can we get our control over this now? And looking forward, how can we make sure that next month we don't have another example of California, Texas, Florida, and Arizona? Because those were the hot zones now. And I'm looking at the map saying, we got to make sure it doesn't happen in other states. So rather than th you know, these games people are playing, let's focus on that. And um, I think one question that is really at the top of a lot of people's minds is what to do about schools, because we're um, seeing this rise in cases. It's, we're heading up to the point when schools will start to need to reopen. How do, you, how do you think about that at a time when you yourself have said that we need to maybe put the pause button on, that we need to start dialing back? Um, what level of risk is acceptable for teachers and for, yeah. for, for, for families? You know, a good point, Ed, and I think that gets back to what I was saying about when we look at the problems in our country, which is a bit different than many other countries. It's a very large, very diverse country, and, and you cannot do anything unidimensionally because you can't look at the New York metropolitan area in the same vein as you look at Casper, Wyoming, or someplace in another mountain state or someplace in the South. You've got to take it individually. So having said that, what I tend to do when it comes to schools is if you look at a broad concept, and the broad concept is that to the, to the extent that you possibly and safely can do it, the default should be that we should try very hard to keep the schools open for the following reason. There are so many downstream unintended ripple effect, negative effects of closing the school on families, on working mothers and fathers and all those other things, negative impact on the kids. So if that's the default, then you say, okay, having said that, look at the country. There are different areas of the country where there's no problem opening a school. But then there are some areas where you may want to open it, but you better be very careful that you have in place the mechanism to really clearly safeguard the health and the welfare of the children and the health and the welfare of the teachers. If you can do that, then proceed. If you can't, then try and get the resources to allow you to do that. So you can't treat all schools the same because they're in, they're in different phases of the outbreak depending upon physically where you are, what state, what city, what county you're in. As long as you realize that the main goal unequivocally is to try and get the schools open, but to do it safely. I've got a question for you about the virus in, 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 um, in particular. Um, you have done a lot of work on, um, on flu, uh, on universal flu vaccines. Flu obviously is still out there and is a huge problem. And this pandemic shows that um, coronaviruses, which I think have been received a lot less uh, research attention, are also clearly a huge problem. How do you think about that question, about apportioning research to all the different kinds of viral threats that, uh, that exist? You know, that's a very good point, Ed. And, and, and I know you'd be interested in it because you're very scientifically oriented. Some, um, a while ago, when we were involved in our pandemic preparedness, we did uh, something that has a threefold component of it, which would encompass exactly what you're asking about coronavirus as now clearly as equal a threat as a pandemic as influenza. Because whenever we were talking about pandemic preparedness, it was almost like parenthesis influenza. Oh, right. When, right. When it isn't, it's beyond that. And I think coronavirus has shown that. And that's the reason why we've taken a part of prototype pathogens, selected microbes that you choose ahead of time, and platform technologies, which is a three-part way that would prepare you for any outbreak, not just influenza. And if you look historically, we were moving along and coronaviruses up to 2002, I think the general public probably doesn't appreciate that, there were four of them that infected humans. And they accounted for anywhere between 15 and 30% of the recurrent common colds, usually in the winter, not always, but usually in the winter. Then 2002 came 
and blew that apart because you had SARS, which all of a sudden became a pandemic. 8,000 cases, almost 800 deaths. Lucky for us, the efficiency with which SARS transmitted was not particularly good. It wasn't a highly efficient spreader, but it did something that was a hint. It went from a bat to a civet cat to a human in China, and then bingo, it became a global pandemic. Then 10 years later, we had MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, bat to a camel, to a human in Saudi Arabia, a smoldering outbreak, not very efficient in transmitting, but highly lethal. So then all of a sudden, along comes 2019, and we have the third one. So you're absolutely right. When we're looking forward, we've got to be looking at classes of pathogens and being able to address each of them in a way that you gain by the previous experience. So the platform technologies that we developed for SARS and for MERS put us in really good stead why we were able to go so rapidly from the sequence of the SARS coronavirus 2 to a phase one trial 62 days after we got the sequence. Ed, that's mind boggling. That mm -hmm. is really fast. And now at the end of this month of July, we're going to be going into a phase three trial. So that's what you were hinting at. And that's what we're doing about using experience of the paths to be able to rapidly respond. But we've got to do even more of that. So we only have time for one more question, Tony. And I wanted to ask about you. Um, I wrote a piece recently about burnout among public health experts, um, folks who've been running on fumes for months trying to fight this pandemic. You clearly have been um, very much a part of that. How are you doing? How are you coping? You know, Ed, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm doing fine. You're right. I am running a bit on fumes, but as I say, the fumes are really thick. So, <laughs> so it, it's, it's enough to keep me going. You know, this is a real challenge. I mean, my whole life professionally has been devoted to public service and, 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 and public health. This is a major challenge in, in public health. And it's something that we really got to pay attention to. You know, I wish we didn't have a lot of the other well, thank you for your efforts, sir. Yeah, you know, the things that you have said uh, during this discussion, I wish we didn't have a lot of those distractions, which I think are noise that get in the way. But I put that aside, try not to let it bother me and just move ahead. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And um, we really appreciate it. Ed, it's always good to be with you anytime.